Hello and welcome to the online open house for the Academic Replacement Building, a proposed project to provide sufficient space to replace the general assignment classrooms in Evans Hall and to relocate some of the academic programs currently located in that building. I'm Kyle Gibson, the Director of Communications for UC Berkeley Capital Strategies. Capital Strategies provides planning, design, real estate, construction, and development services for the UC Berkeley campus. Today, I'll be joined by members of our physical and environmental planning team and our capital projects team to give an overview of the proposed academic replacement building project and answer questions about the project. We'll also be joined by representatives from academic planning and parking services who are working closely with us on this project. The program for today's online open house will begin with a welcome and remarks from Kathy Koshland, the interim executive vice chancellor and provost. And following Kathy, I will provide an overview of the capital project planning and approval process at UC Berkeley and how that project relates to the proposed academic replacement building project. Next, Vice Provost Lisa Alvarez Cohen will give an overview of the academic programming for this project. And then Wendy Hillis, the campus architect and assistant vice chancellor for capital strategies, will give a detailed overview of the proposed project, schedule, and design. And Seamus Wilmot, Assistant Vice Chancellor and Executive Director of Business Operations, will give us an update about parking. And finally, we will conclude by answering questions submitted by the campus community about this project. In addition to answering questions submitted in advance of today's open house, I would like to invite everyone watching today to submit questions through the Zoom chat. Questions submitted through the chat will be visible to, to today's speakers and we'll use the remaining time after today's presentation to answer as many questions as possible. And now to begin, I'd like to introduce the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost to introduce us to this exciting project, Kathy. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for um, joining us today to learn about this project and to um, ask your questions about it. In 2020, the campus received approximately 123 million from the state to address seismic issues associated with Evans Hall. This critical state support has been specifically directed now to the replacement of the general assignment classrooms and LNS advising that are currently in Evans Hall. These are heavily used by students throughout the day. And it's essential that the campus makes the highest and best use of this limited state funding and implements this important project um, in a timely manner. Not doing so places this funding and future funding for the campus in jeopardy. And so it's critical that we stay on a, an appropriate timeline. The academic replacement building will improve and expand our general assignment classroom inventory. And it will also provide a new home for College, the College of Letters and Science uh, undergraduate advising. Providing modern facilities for these programs supports undergraduate student success and future campus enrollment. And locating these classrooms and student service functions on the Dwinnell site is a strategic decision to ensure these functions are centrally located and benefit from adjacencies to other letters and science functions in Dwinnell and BLSB and the student services that are located in Lower Sproul. Locating the Academic Replacement Building Project on the Dwinell site is aligned with our recently adopted campus master plan, which envisioned this site as an interdisciplinary hub building that serves a diverse student population across the campus. And that's very much what the design is all about. So I wanna say thank you for taking the time today to engage with um, us. And, and we look forward to hearing your questions and thoughts on this very important project. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. And let me go ahead and share my screen now. So before we dive more deeply into the academic replacement building project, uh, we'd like to start with an overview of the University of California's formal process for the review and approval of capital projects, and particularly how it relates to this uh, particular project. Since the University of California is a state agency with the authority to entitle capital projects, this means the University of California approves and permits its projects, not local jurisdictions such as cities or counties. UC campuses establish land use guidelines with a long range development plan and conduct environmental review in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act. The entitlement process is overseen by the Board of Regents and guided by state law. Accordingly, UC Berkeley, like every other UC campus, is responsible for implementing a highly managed process 
for the review and consideration of new capital projects. At UC Berkeley, project approval is when the duly authorized person endorses and improves a proposed capital project's budget, including funding sources and its uses, its design, and an environmental analysis of the proposed design. The Board of Regents ultimately reserves the right to review and approve any capital project. However, the Regents have delegated certain approval responsibilities to the UC Office of the President and to the campus chancellors. These delegated responsibilities are only available when projects meet certain criteria. Delegations for project approval are largely determined by a project's budget and funding sources. As the chart shows, the Regents review and approve all capital projects with budgets more than $70 million. This includes the academic replacement building, and this is uh, the, what we'll be taking a closer look at today. And UC Berkeley will be taking this project to the Board of Regents for approval. At UC Berkeley, the Chancellor has appointed an advisory committee for campus land use decisions, capital investments, and project priorities. This committee is named the Capital Planning Committee and is often referred to by its acronym CPC. The CPC assures that UC Berkeley's land use, capital investment decisions, optimize our limited resources, both land and capital, to realize our campus's visions for academic excellence and physical development. The CPC is responsible for tracking and reviewing major capital projects at milestones throughout the project approval process. The CPC has significant involvement in projects with budgets more than $70 million before they go to the Board of Regents for final approval. Reflecting the dual governance structure of UC Berkeley, the Chancellor has asked the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost to chair the CPC and has also appointed both academic and administrative leadership as committee members. Members include the Vice Provost for Academic Planning, the Dean of the College of Environmental Design, the Chair of the Academic Senate, the Chair of the Academic Senate's Committee for Academic Planning and Resource Allocation, the Vice Chancellors for Administration, Finance, Student Affairs, Research, and University Development and Alumni Relations, and the Associate Vice Chancellor for Capital Strategies. The CPC has a process for capital project review and approval that is broken down into four phases. The committee makes recommendations for the chancellor's consideration and approval at the end of each phase. The first phase concept begins when an idea for a new capital project has been identified. The CPC will do a light review using campus resources to determine if the idea aligns with campus priorities and if it is a worthwhile uh, effort to expend additional campus resources to study further. Should the rec CPC recommend a concept advance and the chancellor approves, the project then moves into the second phase, feasibility and planning. During this phase, there is a deeper review that includes outside consultants that validate the proof of concept. During this phase, a project scope, budget, funding strategy, and schedule are refined to align with campus priorities. Initial concept illustrations are refined to give the CPC, the chancellor, and others a more clear idea of how the project may fit within the campus environs. At the end of the second phase, the CPC makes a recommendation to the chancellor if the project should advance into the third phase, design. Should the chancellor find a project to be viable and gives approval for design work, the project is refined within the parameters developed during the prior phase. It is during this design phase that the project is shaped into a detailed design and environmental review occurs. Towards the end of the design phase, the CPC will recommend to the chancellor whether to advance a project into construction. At this point, a project should have a stable design plan, established budget, viable funding strategy, environmental review, and a schedule. Approval of the chancellor of the design phase is when project approval typically occurs. Only after this campus level approval does the campus take the project to the Board of Regents for final approval. After regental approval, a project can advance to the fourth and final phase, construction. This is when construction drawings are prepared and the physical construction occurs. The project is then built according to the approved design budget and schedule. During each of the four CPC project development phases, additional campus committees 
provide input and oversight to further help inform the CPC and Chancellor's review. An academic program committee is appointed and chaired by the Vice Provost for Academic Planning. This committee's membership is tailored for each project and helps to inform the academic community about proposed capital projects. The committee also helps align individual projects with a broader academic mission. The committee also provides input on the instructional and academic program for the proposed building. The academic program committee is also the initial and primary venue for occupants of nearby buildings to learn and provide direct input on issues that could arise through the project development process. This committee meets regularly throughout a project's development. And for the academic replacement building project, the committee's membership includes Dean Rocca Ray and Dean Michael Botchton for occupants of Dwinell Hall and the Valley Life Sciences Building. Another committee is the Capital Projects Finance Committee that reviews a project's financial viability and proposed funding strategy. This committee is chaired by the Vice Chancellor for Administration and members include faculty, external expert advisors, and institutional leaders. Committee members are appointed for three-year terms by the Chancellor and the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost based on nominations put forward by the CPC and the Academic Senate. Technical review is coordinated by Capital Strategies under the direction of the Associate Vice Chancellor for Capital Strategies and the Campus Architect. Two additional committees provide technical expertise to inform a project's design. The Seismic Review Committee is appointed by the Chancellor and consists of faculty and emeriti from the, from the disciplines of structural and civil engineering, a faculty member from the College of Environmental Design and practicing structural engineers. The Design Review Committee advises the campus architect regarding the design of campus buildings and open space. Committee members are also appointed by the Chancellor and consist of the Dean of the College of Environmental Design, design professionals, and faculty from the disciplines of architecture, landscape architecture, urban design, and historic preservation. Capital Strategies also advises campus leadership on project communications. Proposed projects are generally introduced during the planning and feasibility phase. Broader public engagement beyond that occurring with the Academic Program Committee and the Design Review Committee is accomplished during the design phase. For a proposed capital project, to proceed through each phase of the CPC process, approval is required at each step for academic programming, financial review, and for technical review. For proposed capital projects with budgets more than $70 million, the final approval to proceed from design to construction is ultimately given by the Board of Regents. All of the work coordinated in the CPC process for reviewing and approving proposed capital projects is guided by UC Berkeley's Capital Financial Plan and several key campus planning documents. The overarching planning document is UC Berkeley Strategic Plan, which defines our near and long-term visions for academic goals and establishes a strategy for reaching them. Supporting the strategic plan are three primary physical planning documents. The first is the Long Range Development Plan that provides the regulatory framework and land use structure for the physical development of the campus. The second is the Campus Master Plan that establishes a long-term aspirational vision comprising specific development strategies and projects. And the third is the physical design framework that provides high level architectural and urban design guidance that align with our land use and sustainability objectives. And now after reviewing just the fundamentals of the overall process for capital project approval, um, we with the academic build, uh, replacement building have recently moved that project from the second phase of planning and design to the third phase of or planning and planning and feasibility to the third phase of design. And accordingly, we're now engaging with the campus community to provide information about the proposed project and its design. And to start us off, uh, I'd like to introduce the Vice Provost for Academic Planning, Lisa Alvarez Cohen, uh, who's gonna give us an overview of the Academic Programming Committee work on this project. Lisa. Okay, thank you. Um, my role as Vice Provost for Academic Planning is to, um, I, I'm tasked with looking after the academic needs of the entire campus and making sure projects fit within those common good needs of the campus. Um, and part of doing that 
um, I am tasked with putting together academic programming committees uh, for each of these large capital projects. Um, the committee's charge is to represent the campus community's voice and to guide the building's program to respond to campus to overall campus needs. Um, so the members of the academic programming committee are expected to be uh, a communication conduit, um, getting uh, communications out about what's, what the um, project is about and communicating with um, the neighbors and their constituencies. Um, to that effect, uh, we have now instituted a policy where all of the materials that are presented to the academic programming committee are going to be made available to the entire campus community. We have a website that is going to um, be kept up with it. So anybody who wants to find out more about a project can uh, go to that website and get all the information that the academic programming committee uh, gets. The representatives on these academic programming committees are first of all, the stakeholders. So usually that's um, whatever deans are going to be um, occupying or their units are gonna be occupying the building as well as um, it might be a registrar or a vice chancellor or other folks like that. It's a high level committee. So it's the deans that are associated with the building. And then we also ask the deans that are affiliated with nearby buildings um, or their designates uh, to be part of this committee. And that way the people in those buildings um, get the communication about what the decisions made on those, um, uh, on those projects. The committee also um, is represented by the faculty senate. So with the faculty senate, we generally have a member from CAPRA, the Committee on Academic Planning and Resource Allocations. And then we ask um, comms to present us with a list so that we can get uh, two or three additional senate faculty on that committee. We also have a representative from the ASUC, the undergraduates, and the graduate assembly. Um, Let's see. These, these committees meet uh, usually um, a couple of times a semester. More often, if there are um, uh, large changes that um, the architects want to make on the project, then they, they will meet more often than that. Um, at the meetings, the design team presents their proposed um, ideas and asks for directions moving forward on the projects, especially where there are um, uh, overall uh, larger decisions um, to be made. So in this particular case, for example, um, a working group was put together of the registrar's team uh, to talk about and think through the types of classrooms um, that will be needed uh, in this building. <clears throat> um, this committee has met um, in February of this year and we'll be having another meeting, I believe in uh, sometime during the summer. Um, and I've talked about the web page. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the, the um, programming within the building. Uh, as you all know, Evans is considered our biggest seismic risk because of the high density um, of, of population in that building. So our priority has been to de-densify that building um, as, as quickly as possible. Uh, this was it's also seen as an opportunity for the campus to um, address our enrollment growth by increasing and um, increasing the number of classrooms that we um, have, as well as um, having state-of-the-art uh, classrooms um, provided. Uh, the program is limited by the budget. So we went to the, uh, the campus made a decision to go to the state and say, hey, state, we need money to build this building to de-densify Evans. Um, we need classrooms, and then we need office space to pull out as many of the folks from Evans that we can. The state came back and they said, uh, fine, we will provide you a budget. And they gave us a certain budget and they said, you need to make sure you get the classrooms associated with this or that you've requested and then whatever uh, additional space you have left over, you can have that as offices. So a decision was made that we would have uh, the classrooms that were requested and then the rest of the programming would go to um, LNS uh, for their advising and, and other um, uh, executive dean um, activities. 
the registrar working group recommended um, a number of classrooms that I think Wendy will be telling us about. And so I won't go through uh, details on those numbers. Um, and basically with that, I will turn this over to Wendy. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And um, as Lisa was going through the details on the programming, um, I was thinking this slide should be up. Let's see. Um, okay, so um, this is a slide that shows um, the, the main spaces that we have inside the building and um, with programming, both with um, letters and science um, advising, as well as with um, as well as with the registrar, um, we looked at breaking down um, breaking down the spaces. As, as you can see, most of the building will be GA classrooms. This is the line here in blue with a smaller uh, percentage um, of LNS um, advising offices. And then the gold is collaboration space and, um, and office support. The um, LNS advising and the Dean's office is pretty, um, it's pretty straightforward. It's just individual offices. You can see them all marching along here, all the same size um, with some workstations. Um, you know, the classrooms um, were the place where we had a lot, a lot of more detailed discussion um, around what was needed um, based on based on the registrar's data. Certainly looking at the spaces that we currently have in Evans, but looking at where those gaps are. There are a lot of there are a lot of times that the registrar schedules um, schedules things in classrooms that aren't necessarily ideal size wise. Um, so we had a chance to refresh here and to look at what size classrooms we need. Um, one thing I will add is, you know, this is much more square footage of classrooms than we actually currently have in Evans. And part of that was that there was a commitment to keep the same number of seats, the same number of classroom seats that we have in Evans, but because of more modern interactive teaching um, pedagogies, um, the size of those rooms go up. It requires more space per student. So we're targeting the same number of seats, but the rooms themselves get a little bit bigger um, to allow for modern ped pedagogies. And we came away with the need for one auditorium of 400 seats, one large classroom of 100 seats, two medium classrooms of 50 seats, and um, 23 small classrooms. And we try to make these in some ways modules of each other. So you can see, for example, that the medium classroom, two of these add up to a large classroom. To the greatest degree possible, we're trying to future-proof this, knowing that we own and operate our buildings for a long time. There may be the need to for future um, to divide this large room in the future into two small rooms or to combine the two small ones, I'm sorry, the two medium ones into a larger one. Um, we tried to set up modules that would make that work um, in the future. So looking at the site um, for this project, there are a number of things um, that we evaluated um, in looking at our approach to this site. Certainly the landscape characteristics and Strawberry Creek coming through um, this area. We do have a required 50 foot offset from the center line of Strawberry Creek for ecological reasons. Um, and we know that we have Speaker Plaza down here to the south that runs um, by Haas Pavilion, crosses the creek, and then the opportunity to create a new plaza um, or a more defined plaza to the north. We know that we have existing buildings in the area and how do we wanna align with them? Um, and how do we wanna look at historic um, or existing um, conditions for the built environment? Looking at massing, certainly, um, in terms of how tall things are with um, relation to their adjacent buildings um, and looking at how close um, buildings are to adjacent, um, the building is to adjacent structures. We did very clearly hear from the academic planning committee concerns with folks from folks in Dwinnell Hall, particularly those who have offices that face west and look out over the existing parking lot, concerns about um, both noise and disruption of views. Um, with the, with the new construction and the new project. Um, and also thinking about potential for exterior spaces and how we might want to use those um, most efficiently. I will add that you know Evans Hall is a building um, that has a lot of hallways in it. And it's not the best use of space, quite honestly. To the greatest degree possible, we wanted to avoid building a big classroom building with hallways. Um, we wanted to spend our money more efficiently and have um, access in and out of large classrooms from the exterior to the greatest degree possible. We didn't want to spend money on building hallways. 
Um, so certainly looking at the site here and its surrounding context. Um, this is helpful. Our landscape architects um, did an initial look at the site and really characterized, this is an area of transitional landscape going from the, coast red, the coastal redwood riparian um, landscape that we have right along the creek to the coastal live oak landscape that we have on the edge and then to some urban green, which basically I would call lawn, um, but urban green, and um, then going to an urban kind of pathway at Campanile Way, but looking at these gradations that occur across the site. I share this just to let you know that there are, there's lots of consideration going on about the different, um, all of the different influences on the site. And here is a site plan of what we have currently landed on. It is this L-shaped building here. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of how we got there um, and the different considerations that we have. It's an L-shaped building. You see this circle right here. This is the 400 seat auditorium that is largely underground. Um, and this creates a plaza basically at this side of the building that looks out to the trees and um, looks out to, to nature. I think it's worth looking at this here to see relatively how small this building is compared to a lot of its neighbors. Um, certainly compared to Dwinell or Valley Life Science, even look at the size of um, California Hall right here. Um, it's not a huge building and we're aligning, we're attempting to align here with this existing line of buildings, this edge along Campanile Way as a main uh, form determinant. We went through quite a number of ways to fit this program onto the site. This is just, these are none of the ones we selected. This is just to show you that we, that uh, the architects presented lots of ideas to us. Um, and these are ones that we immediately dismissed. We did not want to have a big tall mass adjacent to Dwinell Hall here. Um, we didn't feel that this one with the angle related to kind of the organization of surrounding buildings and this one just seemed really different from anything, um, anything around it. Um, for a while, we were considering a building here. You can see it becomes like a C shape that faces Dwinell Hall with the idea that we would create a courtyard. In between, in between the two. And um, you can see this is the idea of that 400 seat auditorium that would be underground right here and forming this landscape. There are a variety of reasons that we've moved away from this, um, but we did test this. So I share this with you in as much as it informed greatly where we've ended up. And um, I want to explain some of those decisions to you. So this is a model showing the form as it currently exists. It matches the plan I showed you earlier with a taller bar here, a bar pretty much equal height actually to Valley Life Science along Campanile Way, lining up with the face of Dwinell and a much lower bar here um, parallel to Dwinell with this auditorium underground right here. The main reasons we have oriented the building in this way are we clearly heard the concern about views out of Dwinell. This is a two-story volume, and I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you those relative heights in a minute and what that experience looks like. One of the biggest reasons for orienting the courtyard in this direction to the trees is we wanted to have a courtyard that really expanded into nature and took advantage of nature to the greatest degree possible. We didn't want to have a building that turned its back onto nature. By putting this auditorium here, we have created a sunny courtyard. In this opposite scheme here, this is ultimately a shady courtyard. And I've been around Berkeley long enough to know that shady spaces are not the ones that are the most comfortable. You really want the sunny spaces um, for people to gather. So we've created a naturally, this is west facing, a naturally sunny courtyard on top of here. Um, it also works well with solar orientation when we talk about sustainable buildings and the, our solar orientation of the building. Um, those of you who live in Dwinell Hall here, this is a west facing facade and you all know that it gets very hot in your offices. Um, and we've heard that. Um, orienting this bar here actually with the classrooms and it gives us some real advantages for um, how to shade with the walkways on this side, how to shade the classrooms and to have some really nice perhaps translucent glass on this side 
into the classrooms that will create nice light in the classrooms, but will not be too bright and overwhelming. So it creates a very nice space inside. And our goal is ultimately to create a very nice space, you can see trees, a very nice space between the buildings here. Um, I think, you know, ultimately there is a little bit of an advantage um, to having a building here that will shade a little bit of this facade and provide some relief, um, relief to the heat um, that this facade takes on. So looking at it here, you get the tall bar that is facing Valley Life Science. Here's the underground auditorium. And here is the shorter bar facing Dwinnell. One of the other big advantages of this, I'm gonna go back of this, is that all of the loading in and out of the classrooms will be taken from this west side of the building. There will not be any doors going into the classrooms from this alley or road whatever we wanna call the space between Dwinnell and the new building. Um, and the goal here is to really focus all of the activity and noise and other things over on this side, away from the offices here, um, to really focus all of the pedestrian connections that will be coming from Speaker Plaza and coming up and down Campanile Way, loading in through the West. And another view looking back towards Dwinnell. and another view looking down, here's Campanile Way. Um, one major change is that we are assuming right now, and um, we'll see as the design goes forward, that no private vehicles are allowed beyond the bridge um, on Schlesinger Way. So there will be no cars coming. This will no longer be a road. This will be, be this basically be a big plaza and sidewalk in between this building and the Dwinnell Annex. There will be access for fire trucks. That's one of the things we've had to figure out in how to site the building and making sure we can get a fire truck in and out. Um, and also there will be service for things like garbage, um, but those will be um, service access only. So no private vehicles coming in here, which um, really eliminates a lot of the conflicts that we see bet between pedestrians and cars currently. And another view. Um, looking out towards the creek. I'm just showing you all kinds of views of this, another one. Um, we have considered, these are photos that I took from inside Dwinnell, have considered what views will look like. Um, certainly the lower floors will look across and will have a building and trees um, across from it. The upper floors will look out across a roof. This roof at facing Dwinnell will not have any mechanical equipment on it. Any mechanical equipment in this building will be on the tall volume here. So you will be able to look across probably with some kind of a roof um, terrace if we can have the budget for it, but tall, um, the upper floors will be looking out across this and into the trees. So I think this is more um, illustrative here. So looking at a section through this in Campanile Way, you can see the building is just slightly taller than Valley Life Science. We're stacking the classrooms all at the lowest levels because that has the greatest volume going in and out with the offices um, up on the floors above. Here's the space on Campanile Way. Here is the auditorium largely into the ground and the terrace on top of it, the courtyard on top of it. Here is Dwinnell Annex on Strawberry Creek there. Here is a view looking up Campanile Way between the two buildings. This creates a very similar relationship that exists right now between California Hall and Durant. Um, and as you go further up, it's the same relationship and spacing um, in between Doe Library and Wheeler Hall up at the top of Campanile Way. Here's the auditorium with probably the in and out noted here. And this is a view of the building as you walk across the wooden bridge across um, from Speaker Plaza across the creek. Um, coming in, heading towards Campanile Way, here's Dwinnell Annex on your right, here's Dwinnell, and here is the building with the auditorium down at this lowest level. Looking at another section, this one is cut um, east-west. So Valley Life Science is in front of you here. Here's Dwinnell over here to the right-hand side with the offices. You can see that this is a three-story volume that we're proposing. It is largely sunk into the ground at the lowest story. So you get two floors 
above grade. This is the space that is being created in between the two buildings. There is enough room for trees, for some bike parking, and um, for pedestrians. You see that we have this exterior circulation at these bars, these classrooms. Um, so we won't have any interior hallways. We have what we're thinking of as exterior galleries, which are your hall, which are your exterior hallways that would get you into these classrooms and provide shading from this side um, into those rooms. You have the auditorium, which enters from the west, but is also a courtyard roof terrace on top of it. Little closer look at the space that is being created that would be created in between Dwinnell. Again, it's the first three floors of the building that would be affected in terms of views. Um, and this classroom. Like I said, we don't envision any doors um, coming in and out of the building on this side, mostly because this level is not the same as the floor level here. So unless we're going to build some big stairs coming in here, there aren't going to be any doors um, on this. The desire here to keep it, knowing that there are offices here um, with windows that are open to keep this quiet, um, as quiet as a college campus can be. And here is a view. Here's Dwinnell on the right. Here is the proposed building on the left. This is the same section I was just showing you. If you have offices on the first, second or third floors here, you're looking across at trees and building. Up here, you're looking out across the roof of this building. Here's Dwinnell Annex here. This becomes one kind of big plaza and sidewalk area. And I did take a walk around campus um, earlier this week looking for conditions um, you know, between buildings that are of similar dimension to what we're talking about here between Dwinnell and the new building. Um, I think this one here on the left between Li Ka Shing and Mulford is, um, is a good one. Um, it's one of our, one of our it's, it's about this exact same dimension as what we would be doing. This is about the same height um, as what we're talking about um, with the new building. And similar kind of landscaping and uses here with um, the bike parking. This one is a little bit narrower um, between, this is between Morgan and the plant biology building, a little bit narrower than what we're thinking, but with trees. And this one here is between um, Koshland and um, plant biology, um, about the same dimension as what we're talking about doing, but again, without trees. I mean, I think we're pretty committed to doing some trees along this walkway. The desire is to make it look nice. Um, I don't have any design on that yet, but please know that that is foremost in our mind. We certainly have been looking at pedestrian circulation and bike ne network in this area. This goes back to our campus master plan and long range development plan. Here is Dwinnell right here, um, looking at all of the major different pedestrian routes that exist along the site shown in black, the volumes are conveyed by the width of them, um, the width of the lines, um, as well as the primary and secondary bike routes that exist on the site. This is data that is taken from our long range development plan. Prior to COVID, um, we had a chance to do pedestrian counts and look at pedestrian volumes in a 12 hour period. Um, and what I want to show you, and here is Dwinnell here, you know, this is, even though this is traffic, pedestrian traffic coming from BART really does travel in this direction up. This is a, as far as campus goes, it is a pretty lightly traveled area compared to others that we have on campus. Certainly Sproul Plaza, you get lots of pedestrians there. You get more up here. Um, when it comes to Northgate and the um, engineering area. Um, you know, what this tells us is that we have capacity here um, and also that removing those conflicts that we have between pedestrians and vehicles in this area um, is going to be one of the major, um, will be one of the major changes that really um, allows us to have a greater volume of students coming in and out of this classroom space. And that is the end of my slides. And so I am going to pass it back to Kyle. Thanks, Wendy. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to Seamus, uh, who can give us a quick update on parking. Yes, thanks very much. Um, as you saw from those drawings, um, the building will be taking um, over the Dornella parking lot. Um, our plan right now is to keep that parking lot open as long as possible. 
um, and use it until you know the so, uh, until the fences go up to start the new building. Um, we are taking into account um, and working with capital strategies and the design team to make sure that uh, you know service access to Dwinell and Dwinell Dwinell and Dwinell Annex are uh, remain. Um, as Wendy pointed out, there would be fire and service, just not personal vehicles. Um, and we'll be working to making sure that there is proper ADA access um, for um, vehicles um, and, and um, ADA folks for uh, those buildings. At the same time, um, we have uh, worked with capital, uh, the Capital Planning Committee to be able to get approval to go to the feasibility and planning stage of a new parking structure. Um, that's, you know, has been called out in the campus master plan that the campus due to the construction and expansion um, that we do need more parking spaces on campus. Um, and so we will, uh, we have already started the work and have already gone through um, phase one and are in the middle of phase two for the feas feasibility and um, uh, planning stage for a new parking structure um, that we're hoping will be anywhere between um, you know, sort of that 350 to 600, maybe 700 parking spaces to really try and capture, um, you know, some of the lost parking spaces that we're going to be seeing. Um, and um, that's really the, the quick rundown that we have of the parking lot. Back to you, Kyle. Thanks, Seamus. Uh, with our remaining time left, we'll go ahead and answer as many questions as we can uh, that have come in uh, through the chat and uh, ahead of time through the Google Doc. Um, if we do not get to your question today, please know that we will respond to you in writing. And also, if you have additional questions after today's presentation, please feel free to email us at capitalstrategies at berkeley.edu, um, which is um, the email address is on our Capital Strategies website at the bottom of every page. So please feel free to reach out to us. We're more than happy to answer your questions. And uh, just to kind of kick us off, I've added a few more of our uh, project team. Uh, Valerie, Todd, and Maria um, from our PEP capital projects and space planning teams. Um, so actually Val and um, probably Wendy, we've got a question about how do we think about and talk about needs of disabled students as we plan for new buildings like this? Could you speak a little bit to that? Sure. Uh, so part of our programming has involved engagement with our access compliance group on campus. And um, we're working with our design team in this particular project to allow for the main entry to our auditorium and west facing areas to be at grade. And the slope allows us to create a secondary access probably off Campanile way and via sloped areas to that plaza that Wendy showed. So we anticipate we're going to have access to two levels of this uh, project just from the different grades and throughout the building uh, we will be again working via code and with our campus community to ensure uh, adequate and more than adequate uh, accessible accessibility throughout the building. And if I could add really quickly, right now that road that goes to the back circle um, at Dwinnell is actually steeper than, um, it does not meet, um, it, it's not um, ADA accessible, um, it's, it's steeper than, um, than code. So this project also provides us an opportunity to even out the slope of that road a little bit um, and that pathway so that that now becomes um, accessible um, to people in wheelchairs specifically. Um, we've had a few questions, Wendy, that are a little specific about design of like, for example, what parts of the building will and won't have windows. Um, we're still very early in the design process. Could you kind of just maybe uh, speak a little bit to like where we are in that process of design? Yeah, um, I hope we get into that discussion soon. Um, it, it'll be interesting to start to see what this building actually looks like. I assume um, you know, my assumptions are that there will be um, a little bit of difference in windows um, between classrooms, which are on the lower levels, and the offices, which are on the levels above, um, because the needs inside those spaces are very different. Um, certainly, we want to make sure that the classrooms, well, they need natural light and people like natural light, that um, they also do not have windows that cause um, glare and that we have rooms that allow for um, slides and other things to be shown. So, you know, I think there, there will definitely be windows and lots of windows. How those are deployed across the facade, I think what we're still um, 
we're still determining that. Um, and we look forward to coming back and sharing that with you. We just haven't had any real discussions on it yet. Do you have anything to add on that, Val? Uh, no, we, we okay. really haven't, haven't developed exactly where windows are, but they'll certainly be a big part of the conversation ongoing. Um, and I did notice a question about oper operable windows, um, which are planned as part of the energy um, uh, sustainability part of this project would be to allow for operable windows in offices uh, throughout. That is certainly our, our intention. And if I can add, all of the classrooms in the new building will be air conditioned as currently planned. Wendy, uh, we've also had several questions about deliveries to Dwinell Hall, and I think you kind of mentioned this uh, a little bit that we're still planning on maintaining the loading dock at Dwinell and access to it. Yes, so that is all in discussion with how that loading dock works on the back. Certainly, um, folks like FedEx and um, other, you know, we, we need to be able to have deliveries made. So that that is all being discussed and in the works. Um, there just won't be any private vehicles beyond the bridge is our is our current thinking. Excellent. Um, and I think we had just, uh, again, a couple questions, which Lisa, you might be able to answer, which is, could you speak a little bit more to the uh, academic participants that have been part of the academic programming committee? The academic participants? Yeah, what groups and have been involved and in, uh, how you go about choosing who will be on the committee for a project? Oh, I thought I, I outlined I think you that. did. Uh, we might have had some people join a little late, so um, I think it's good to repeat. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll repeat it. Um, the Academic Programming Committee has uh, representatives from um, the, the deans or the provosts or vice chancellors who are affiliated with the project, that is, those who will control the space. Then it also has um, deans from affiliated uh, buildings or neighborhood buildings around them or their designates. It, and um, each of the buildings has at least, uh, at least one designate or dean from it. Um, there's also Senate members. There's a member of the Committee on Academic um, Planning and Resource Allocation, um, and then two to three at-large members who are chosen by comms. Uh, comms provides us a list and uh, we choose the um, faculty from those. And then we have a representative from ASUC for the undergraduates and then graduate assembly um, for the graduate students. Uh, so that's how those um, committees are chosen. Uh, there are also, I saw a question in there with respect to um, how were the size of the classrooms chosen and I thought I addressed that also, but um, we worked very closely with the registrar uh, the registrar knows across campus what the general assignment needs are um, and, and where our shortfalls are. And so um, they had a very strong voice in, uh, in deciding what the mix of the classrooms would be. Great, thanks. Uh, Wendy, could you um, touch for a moment on our notification uh, policy or practices for, with local tribes for when we do ground disturbance? Absolutely. So um, this is a I'm trying to think how to make my answer very simple. Um, so we are in the process of developing a new um, a new notification process um, with all of the tribes for individual projects. As it currently stands, tribes were consulted when we did our long range um, development plan. And this was done in compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act and um, AB 52, if you're familiar with that um, statute. And, um, and we consulted with, tri with tribal entities um, on the whole of the plan for the campus for the next 20 to 30 years. There is a desire to um, have greater communication with tribes as individual projects move forward um, and to bring tribal monitors on for individual projects. That is something that we are currently working through in consultation with tribes in terms of how that works. Um, we do have, um, as part of our legal obligations under CEQA, archeological monitors um, that come out on sensitive sites like this one because it is close to the creek. So we already have had an archeological um, investigation um, of the site um, to see if there's anything that we, that we need to worry about. This is part of why we no longer 
build within 50 feet of the center line of the creek. Part of that is about not disturbing what is what are known to be areas of um, a high amount of fines. Fines. I hope that answers the question. I think it does, um, and I think it's also. Um, similar, Wendy, that we're pretty much too early in the design process right now to know precisely which trees um, on the site will or won't be preserved. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, our goal has been there is a tree policy for campus. And, um, you know, we have what are called specimen trees um, that exist because um, of their size or because of something special about them. And those are identified on the site. We're not affecting any of those. Um, we certainly will be removing kind of the trees, the parking lot trees that have been planted um, on the parking lot, none of which are specimen trees, um, but taking very seriously the oak trees that are in the pines that are adjacent to the site. Um, there has been, um, th there have been, there has been a lot of discussion that's gone into that along with an evaluation um, by an arborist um, about the condition of trees um, in the vicinity. Fantastic. And um, just to quickly answer, uh, in general, a few questions that have been asked uh, through the chat about Evans Hall, um, even though the focus of this uh, open house is really on the academic replacement building, just quickly addressing that um, no project has yet been proposed for the site of Evans Hall following the demolition of the building. We've also not yet uh, proposed demolition of that building yet. We're still in the process of relocating the programs that are currently in that building. Uh, which this project is one of many that will help accomplish that. In the coming years, uh, there will be a project eventually proposed to demolish Evans and subsequently a project proposed for a new project at that site. And that project would be fully um, required to go through the project approval process, the very detailed project approval process that we went through at the beginning of this uh, program today. So we will eventually be doing more outreach on that um, in the coming years. Um, Could I jump in on that really yeah, quickly, Kyle, definitely. and say, um, that, you know, that, that new building that would go on the Evans site is seen as being a very, as, as currently conceived um, without a project, as being a very large um, underground building that provides a lot of vibrationally sensitive space for engineering and, and sciences. Um, so while it might be deceiving in as much as we don't have a tall building proposed in that location. It is a very big workhouse of a building that would extend underneath um, the mining circle up there um, with a lot of square footage. Thank you. Um, and I think we, we've had a couple questions about um, eventually digging um, foundations for the new building and doing that uh, sensitive and concerns about the method that we might do that. Um, obviously, we're still very early in the design process of this building, uh, but Wendy and Val, could you maybe speak to that just a little bit about how we kind of usually uh, handle foundations and things for buildings? Um, so maybe just to back up a little ways, uh, the broad parameters are that uh, construction projects on campus do uh, respond to and have to be uh, compliant with the LRDP construction design standards, master planning, which set up a whole bunch of really, really detailed parameters about uh, the monitor and the mitigation during construction. So areas such as air quality or noise or vibration or dust, there's broad guidelines on those. And after we bring a contractor on board to join the design team, we start to develop more project specific responses to how we make sure we comply with those areas, uh, how there's a reporting process for that um, that is undergone. So at this point in, in a broad way, there's a lot of parameters that we'll be working under. And when we have a more specific design and a contractor, we will get a little bit, quite a bit more detailed on how we establish that. The foundation don't know exactly what it is yet, but all of our early survey information indicates we won't have a deep pile driven foundation type, that it will be a spread, shallow spread foundation type, which is um, not the process of digging giant holes, super noise making. <laughs> there will be some shoring involved in this project because we have that slope and that area we are cutting into the earth between Dwinnell and the parking lot. Uh, but in general, 
uh, I think the foundation work, again, would be the, a, a shallow foundation type is what all the indication is right now. And Val, uh, just because we're kind of coming up on time, I think a good way to end might be, um, could you give us a little bit of insight into how we meet with um, occupants of buildings nearby and handle uh, regular updates um, to buildings around the site during construction uh, once that begins in a year or so? Yeah, we typically will work with our contractor, um, our facility managers, and uh, Kyle, yourself, in order to uh, give look aheads about the information for construction activities and the schedule. So we can work with Kyle to have every twice a month or weekly, whatever seems to be appropriate, communicate the main activities that are coming up. And it allows the surrounding building occupants to, to have an awareness of what's coming and think about it. Certainly occupants can be thinking about things now in terms of those uh, offices or collaboration areas that are right on the edges, maybe working with space planning uh, for your collaboration areas to think about in the future, perhaps those we wanna have some backup. Um, so there's things you can be thinking about in terms of direct impact, but during the course of construction, uh, regular communication about what's coming up uh, is part of what we can do during a construction project. Thanks, Val. All right, with that, uh, we're just a little bit over time. Um, thank you everyone for sticking with us for a couple minutes longer today. Um, to each of our panelists who all took time out of their day today to present, thank you very, very much. Uh, for all of you who took time of your schedules to participate with us, thank you as well. As I said, if uh, we did not see your question or, or did not answer it, uh, we'll be going through everything that came in during the chat. Um, during uh, today's uh, open house and responding back to you. Similarly, please feel free to reach out to us uh, in case we missed your question. Again, capitalstrategies at berkeley.edu is our email address. And we'll also be providing more and regular updates regarding the project as the design process moves forward on the Capital Strategies website. We have a page set up dedicated to this project and we'll be posting more information there. Um, and again, thank you everyone for being with us today and uh, thank you very much.